everybody. Welcome to the World of CONCACAF podcast. We are here at the news desk. I am Eric Schmitz. And I'm Jonathan Sleep. And I'm Donald Wine. And uh, we're here finally at the end of this Copa America. Uh, we got a lot to talk about. First, before we get started, I do want to send some love to our friends down the islands, uh, throughout the region, uh, everyone affected by Hurricane Barrel. Um, I know Grenada got hit pretty hard. St. Vincent got hit pretty hard down in Union Island. Um, I know in Grenada, they went since the hurricane hit on July 1st, they've pretty much been shut down. But good news, the Grenada Premier League kicks back off this weekend. So power to them for uh, sticking through it and dealing and, with all and, the damage. And peace to Houston because Houston got flooded out yeah. as well. Um, yeah. by barrel uh yeah. barrel is barrel's a bitch yeah well like up in buffalo where my family is like they had tornadoes down the street from where my parents are so um yeah it's it's uh been a tough go for a lot of people but a lot of serious stuff going on but we're here to talk about soccer and mainly Concacaf. so like the least serious thing we could possibly talk about um And speaking of least serious, let's talk about a tournament that's not even ours that, you know, someone people thought was a big deal. Uh, So we had a Copa America here. Con Mobile decided they wanted to come make some money in the U.S. Uh, So after the rousing success of the 2016 Copa America Centenario, uh, we had the 2024 Copa America here in the United States. Uh, I know, Donald, you went to a bunch of games. I went to a bunch of games. Jonathan went to one. I think we'll kind of save our experiential talk for the one more round. But um, so we get if, you're patron, results, yeah. if you're not a patron, if you're not a patron and you want to know what is this one more round, one more round is what we do after we record this episode uh, where the three of us get a drink, get a little loose and uh, have some discussion. So uh, first of all, shout out to all of our patrons um, right now. Um, but also if you're interested and you think you find what we talk about somewhat interesting, um, sign up for the Patreon at patreon.com slash podcacaf. And it starts at just a dollar a month. Yeah. Boys, you guys just, you know, knock that out of the park. Uh, <laughs> We're good. <laughs> love it. Yes. Uh, if you aren't already a member of our Patreon, make sure you sign up. Uh, We'll repeat that again at the end of the episode, Uh, but a lot of fun conversation about to happen there, but back to the tournament. Uh, So we had six CONCACAF teams participating in the tournament. We're just going to kind of run through how they all fared Um, in group a Canada finished the group stage uh, with one win, one draw, one loss, four points. They advanced to the knockout stage in group B. The two CONCACAF teams, Mexico and Jamaica, failed to advance. Mexico going one win, one draw, one loss, and Jamaica failing to win a game. Uh, We will talk about both those teams more later in this episode, as well as the United States, who also failed to advance after one one win and two losses in Group C, while Panama in Group C advanced to the knockout stage, two wins, a loss, six points and in group D Costa Rica one win one draw one loss four points so the two big success stories are really Canada and Panama and for Canada Jesse Marsh just taking over the head coaching role I'm sorry the MLS Canada men's national team head coaching role uh, prior to the tournament Um, we're at the point in the tournament where Canada is effectively done uh, they advanced to the semifinals after beating Venezuela in penalties in the knockout stage, uh, but fell to Argentina 2 0 in the semifinals. So they are playing a third place game against Uruguay, a third place game in Copa America. I don't know if there's anything that doesn't mean less than that. I don't know if I phrased that right. The Gold Cup third place game that only happened once and never happened again because it was so yeah. bad. Yeah. Because it was so pointless. Uh, but Panama, the other team to advance, uh, they had a tough go against Colombia, five, nothing loss. So Canada 
the furthest advancing CONCACAF team. Jesse Marsh, obviously off to a great start. Um, do we think we've learned something about Canada here? No. Um, and I'm gonna, <laughs> I, I, so I think, you know, it's all great. It's all fine and great that Canada made it through, but like, let's talk about how lucky Canada got in the group stage. Uh, they scored a single goal in all three matches. Uh, they lost two zero to Argentina. They won one zero against um, Peru, but that was after playing, they got to play 30 minutes uh, up a man after uh, Miguel Araujo got a red card in the 59th. And then they advanced after um, a awfully boring zero zero draw against Chile, where they played 60 minutes up a man and got just only three shots on target. So like, I, I just don't feel like, you know, a lot of people like, oh, you know, isn't it great seeing what Canada did with a largely MLS roster because, you know, they were missing some key guys, but like, I don't think we like really learned anything about this Canadian team because they got lucky. Like, and, but sometimes that's what you need in tournaments. Like that's not a, that's not a, like, that's not a knock on them to an extent. Oh, it is uh, to an extent. There's always shade being thrown to Canada. Yeah. Um, but I just don't, th- I, I just don't think you can say that you really learned anything when, you know, of the 180 minutes you played in the group stage, uh, you got, no, of the 270 minutes you played in the group stage, literally a third of that you played up a man. And in that time, you only scored a goal and your only goal came at a point when you were up a man. So like pump the brakes, Canada. Yeah. I mean, they have played five games in this tournament. They have won one of them. Is that a great tournament? I don't know, but they're also getting six games out of it. They're still playing up on the final weekend of the tournament. Um, I think in the end, it's a massive win for Canada just in the sense that they're getting the experience. Uh, They're playing some tough teams. They're finding a way to grind out results. I mean, two two results against Argentina, both 2-0 losses, I think against the World Cup champs, that's okay if you're Canada. Um, Clearly, they don't have a lot of depth. Uh, Jesse Marsh hasn't had a lot of time to instill any sort of system. And you can tell that as games wear on, there's lapses, but they're coming out organized and tough early on. So, you know, I'm happy for Canada. They're getting some sort of like, I don't know. They're catching the country's imagination with the World Cup two years away. But I think as far as their actual competitive, I don't know. They they still need some depth. Look, I, I think there's a lot of things we could say about Canada, right? Let's start with this. You mentioned, you know, Jonathan mentioned that they've only scored two goals in the entire tournament. They also gave up probably the the wildest goal in the entire tournament uh, in that in that game against Venezuela with that what was it forty five yard uh, chip of uh, Maxine Cripro, mm-hmm. but. If you even go back to the two friendlies before the the Copa America, they scored a grand total of zero goals in those two games. Uh, yes, yeah, sure, they drew France, but everyone's like, oh, they drew France. It, we drew France in 2018. It didn't mean much. Um, they, they, you know, it's, it's one of those things where they have the best player in CONCACAF in Alfonso Davies. They have one of the best strikers in CONCACAF in Jonathan David. They have another great, great talent who unfortunately broke his leg. Uh, Tejan Buchanan uh, broke his leg right before, I guess, was it right before Argentina, right before Venezuela, one of those two games uh, that there was, I'm sorry, right before Venezuela um, yeah. that he broke his leg in, in practice. And that's, that's a shame. We really, you know, I hope he gets back soon, but they have those three guys. They have a great, you know, a pretty decent goalkeeper. We joked, it, but in all seriousness, they added by subtraction by not taking their captain Milan Borjan to the tournament. Yeah. And they had all these opportunities and they had a coach who was looking, who had a chip on his shoulder. He wanted this team to play with a chip on his shoulder and he wanted them to go out and play inspired ball. I didn't see it. And a lot of people were saying that, you know, because Canada advanced the furthest of all the CONCACAF teams that the Kings of CONCACAF, you know, 
I don't I don't know what <laughs> brakes you have in in your your brake pads. You you may need some extra brake pads for the brakes that you need to pump on that because if that is the indicative of cocky half reminder the United States who crashed on the group stage have played two fewer games than Canada and have scored one more goal. Like that, <laughs> that's not yeah. inspired soccer it, it, in a results based economy, right? Yeah, sure. They got the results that they needed, but don't, you, you don't, you know, don't, don't, don't piss on me and tell me it's raining and tell me that they're playing beautiful soccer and that this is, you know, the, a really good team that's come together under, you know, extraordinary circumstances. They have come together under extraordinary circumstances, but they have not played great soccer and they should be the first ones to admit it. And yeah, sure. They get another chance to go out, you know, with a wind and maybe get third place, but this is not indicative of what they should be. And if this is what they want to strive for, they're going to be humbled super quickly. Yeah, for sure. And now the tough thing about a tournament like this is that you might have some overreaction. I think we're, what we're talking about Canada is like telling them not to overreact in the positive way. It's like pump the brakes. You didn't necessarily, well, this isn't as great as it seems for you at the moment. Um, there were multiple teams in CONCACAF who are reacting strongly to the results of this tournament. Uh, and I think we should just go right to it. Uh, Greg Berhalter out as, head coach of the U S men's national team. I think we can all say it was expected to some extent, but like it was needed. Yeah. I uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say like, I think, you know, going into this for the United States, similar situation that Canada and Mexico find themselves uh, being that you're, there is no qualifying for these teams. Add into the fact that with uh, UEFA Nations League, uh, a a AFC qualification, uh, CAF qualification, all of these other nations, there is not going to be as much time for these teams to face top level competition before 2026. Uh, so we knew for a lot of these teams and especially the U S that this was going to be, you know, the real measuring stick for uh, a post world cup, Greg Berhalter team, seeing how this team could evolve, what maybe things could be done differently uh, in, you know, the next cycle. And so, I mean, I think most people knew that going into this, that, you know, getting out of the group was the bare minimum uh, you have a Bolivia team that is not one, not gotten a result away from home since 2015. Um, uh, high altitude merchants, as uh, our friend <laughs> Vishal uh, kept referring to them as. They, they did. Um, they did get one result in Saudi Arabia in that FIFA series in March. Yeah, the but FIFA that was the series, first time right? in a long. But no time. competitive. They they have yeah. Yes, no correct. No mm -hmm. no no competitive. Um, and then uh. You know, they had Panama in that group that you know, U.S. shouldn't be losing at home soil to Panama. We saw, you know, there being, you know, a terrible, not a, a red card from uh, Timothy Weah that set the team back, forcing them to play 60-ish plus minutes a man down. And even though they got the goal, they weren't able to hold on to it. And so I think if it's your Comitable is your big, your best competition that you're going to see up until the World Cup. And then if you're not getting those results, yeah, I think it was pretty expected um, with the U.S. getting knocked out that, that Craig Rockholter was going to be gone. I, the things that you just mentioned, right? The red card to Tim Weah, the terrible referee in the Uruguay game, the, you know, just the atrociousness of some of the fouls. You know, we, there was that stat that the United States had the most fouls per or most yellow cards per foul um, of any team in the in the tournament. And all the CONCACAF teams were in the top you know, five, except for I think it was Panama was in was number seven. And all of those things. Are not Greg Berhalter's fault, but when you don't get out of the group, which is a bare minimum thing to do for the United States in Copa America, that is how coaches get fired. And that is what happened. There was, you know, in the end. The results were not there. The play was not there. And whether or not it was attributed to, you can pinpoint, you know, where it went wrong. There had to be a change and it, it was, a, it was a needed change. I, I, you know, I think Greg did a great job to get us back to this point, you know, being in Kuva in 2017, we were at a, we were at a much better spot now than we were 
back yeah. then, seven years ago, before he took over. And so he got us to a point where we got back to the World Cup, we got out of the group and what have you. But we had we had all talked about this together. Second cycle coaches for the United States rarely work out. I have a um, really bad track record. <laughs> really bad. I mean, the last three second cycle coaches we have had have been fired. Um, you know, that that is that is the that is the long and short of it. And at the end of the day, two years less than two years before the World Cup, they need to shake things up and try and reinvigorate. The program try and re re energize the fan base. Um, we will talk about that in one more round. But I think mm. at the end of the day, the results were weren't there. And when when it was down to his job or keeping it or let, or, or going somewhere else, the federation said, "Hey, the results just aren't there. Um, your your whatever whatever's on your side is not really on your side. These results just aren't up to par, and we're not where we're supposed to be." Yeah, and I, I go ahead. I was say, like, I think the other thing too, like talking about like some of the adversity that the U.S. faced, you know, especially like we think about the red card and and the fouls and, and the Uruguay game is like it wasn't as much the red card. It was like how the team performed and and the the adjustments that were made after the fact. That was the problem. Um, the, you know, they got the goal. They went up. Uh, but then, you know, didn't do enough to secure it. They, sh- they could have won that game. And, and there was, I think there may have even potentially been some selection issues. Um, but then, you know, the against Uruguay, they just like, they, yeah, they had three shots on target, but they never once, I never felt that a goal was coming uh, being in that, being in that stadium. Um, you know, granted half that you can't see as far as away, but it just it just never felt like there was something coming and that there was very few ideas off of the bench. And I think that that tells the the biggest story. Yeah, I don't necessarily know. It's not I don't know if it's due to the results as much as the results were the final blow. Yes, uh, because really going back to the Panama game, it's not that they lost the game. It's how they lost it. It was a failure of management to deal with the situation. And like you said, Jonathan, like selection issues, like they mismanaged the situation. They got the goal, like irregardless of that, it was zero zero when way went off and the subs that were made at halftime, the way the shape was like there, the way he reacted to everything, it was a failure And that failure put them in a situation against Uruguay. I mean, yeah, it never felt like, they were threatening, but also we were all watching that game under the lens of this is an impossible situation. And to put a to put a, a B in this, I think yes, all of that is correct. I also think the players share some blame in this, right? Like yes. they didn't play up to their expectation, up to their expectations, up to ours. They didn't play up to the best of their ability. There's a lot of mistakes on the field that again aren't Greg's fault. This is not on Greg Berhalter, all of it, right? But at the end of the day, the manager is the, you know, the, the head coach is the head coach for a reason. And as we said, if you get grouped, that's how coaches get fired. It's, it, yeah. it made it, it could, he could go and say, hey, look, all these things happen that are not my fault. Guy kicked, you know, sabotaged me, whatever. But at the end of the day, the result was we get, we didn't get out of the group. And that was the bare minimum. And since you didn't meet the bare minimum, a change had to be made. Getting grouped at a tournament you're hosting that you're hosting before, first time, before, first yeah. time that a group that a host had been failed to get out of the group stage. I push yeah. back a little bit on that stat because the U.S. weren't really the hosts. It yeah. was a tournament that happened in the United States, but mm-hmm. U.S. soccer had no part in or Concacaf like had no part in the organization of it. It was so I would say. Not the not necessarily the host country. Throwing an asterisk on it. Yeah. Well, I want to get to that more later on. We'll wrap up the episode talking about that a little bit. But just to put a bow on Burhalter, um, I think it was Copa America was the final nail in the coffin. But going back to Trinidad, the failure to win there, uh, how poor they looked in the Nations League semifinals. And then this entire summer, like five one against Colombia, five one against Colombia, uh, like it was a trend with Burhalter, and I think they knew that they had to pull a plug, especially with all of the fan pushback. And I think the fan pushback might have been 
uh, a key part of getting them to actually make the call here. Um, Let's not give certain people too much credit. Yeah, we don't want to give certain people too much credit, but we're going to give ourselves some credit here. Um, <laughs> but we'll talk more about Burhalter on one more round, as if we haven't, you know, teased that enough already on this episode. Uh, there's some other coaching stuff going on around Concacaf. Uh, another team that disappointed in Copa America and is looking for a new coach as a result, much different situation, but Jamaica, uh, Helmir Harald Grimson, uh, resigned after, uh, Jamaica fell out winless, uh, in the tournament, he resigned and oddly enough already has a new job, uh, report in the Jamaica Gleaner seems to think that, uh, Helgrimson was, angling for the job in Ireland for months. And when he quit and said, Oh, I want to go back to Iceland. He was just really saying, Oh, I don't want to deal with Jamaica anymore. They're going to pay me 650,000 euros a year to go coach in Ireland. Um, I'm on your boys in green. Yeah. But like Jamaica, where's Jamaica go from here? Uh, Halgrimson had had a really good tenure there. They obviously showed a lot of promise. Um, but now they are without a coach right before uh, qualifying continues next year. Here's the thing about Jamaica. I think Jamaica's performance was very disappointing because for the first time, I mean, minus Leon Bailey, who that, that drama that they had right before the tournament started where they called him in, even though he said, I'm not playing for you. And then they kind of said, Oh, he's, he's, he's suspended now. He's suspended. So he's like, yeah, I'm suspended because I'm not coming. Um, <laughs> but that federation, we have talked about the issues that that federation has had for oh, almost two years now, right? Like they, could, they couldn't even afford to send their women's team to the Women's World Cup last summer. They had to get GoFundMes, several GoFundMes to, to fund their training and fund the actual trip to New Zealand and Australia. They have talked about some of the money issues facing that federation, Guys not getting paid. Leon Bailey has said that he had not been paid in like what two years or something like that. He was paying for his own flights. He he was paying for his own flights, showing up to training, and there wasn't even enough training gear for people to wear. Right, they were paying for they were paying paying the rent fields, paying to get ball, like going to you know sporting goods stores to get soccer balls so they could practice. Those are little things that you know guys are not used to. And this was supposed to be the tournament where they finally got all of their their horses in right all those guys that came that they recruited from England and from Europe to come play for them this was supposed to be the tournament that they put it all together and that clearly was in the back and front of their mind as they played because they got dusted in in in, some, in these games so I, i'm i'm curious as to why i mean the the ireland part thing like my man was probably one foot out the door because they're like it doesn't matter how much they're paying me they are actually ireland's actually going to pay me Right. Like the, there's there's a lot of things going on in that federation that needs to get sorted out. Yeah. The, I'll just read this from the Jamaica Gleaner. The article was uh, uh, the title is Acting in Bad Faith. Um, Dennis Chung, the general secretary of the JFF, uh, suggested that while the federation was hoping the Icelander would finish his contract, there was a smoking gun when Helgrimson suggested they wanted to return to Iceland and be in Jamaica only for match days. Uh, he said, quote, we are disappointed that he couldn't carry through with everything, but there could have been signs that this was coming. In January, he did indicate that he wanted to return to Iceland and be- come to Jamaica for the games. However, we didn't expect that it was because of another job that was being negotiated. We had a contract up until the 2026 World Cup. So now that this news has surfaced, a lot of things now make sense, he explained. Again, that's from the Jamaica Gleaner. Shout out, uh, CONCACAF Media. It's yeah, like I said, there's a lot going on there. We I don't know that we know the full story, right? Like we we've gotten, you know, the the Jamaican Federation side, but Jamaican Federation hasn't had a, a lot of credibility over the last year and a half uh, with regards to funding and and other things that we just discussed. So uh, hopefully they can get this together. Hopefully they can find a coach that will come in and and write that ship because, like you said, they got Nations League, then they got World Cup qualifying, and they have a lot of this is. They have probably this is probably the best chance that they have had since 1998 to qualify for World Cup, and it feels like they are blowing it. Yeah, uh, 
one thing that we didn't talk about when we were talking about Canada and success, and we just kind of touched on it. So one of the key successes for all of the teams participating in Copa America is the prize money. Every team that participated got $2 million. So Jamaica just got a check for $2 million. Huge for them, huge for this coaching search. But going back to Canada, we've talked many times and laughed many times about how broke Canada is. Mm -hmm. Just by advancing this far in the tournament, they've made at least $6 million in prize money just by getting this far. Uh, So it's been a huge, huge summer for Canada. Um, I guess Jamaica is now in a good position to find uh, a new coach. Uh, The report is that they are already in discussions with coaches around the world, and they're hoping to have somebody in place by August. What's that? (laughs) It's going to be Jurgen Klopp. (laughs) Listen, if I was Jurgen Klopp, I'd rather be in Jamaica. But. I that's I mean if I'm looking for a retirement gig and I want to sit on the beach uh, it's not a bad uh, not a bad setup. Yeah, it's a good life. Uh and one other coaching thing we want to touch to, touch on is uh the mess going down in Mexico. <laughs> um <laughs> if if you feel bad about the US coaching situation, there's always Mexico to make you feel better about it. Uh Mexico of course failing to advance out of the group in group B. Uh, just with the one win, they beat Jamaica one nothing. Not not a great performance uh, for Mexico, but um, Jaime Lozano, who had taken over as interim last summer, uh, became the permanent coach in August of 2023 after winning the Gold Cup with Mexico last year. Uh, now there's discussion that he's about to be replaced. So the Mexican Federation is apparently talking to Javier Aguirre. Uh, the coach who coached them in 2002 and 2010 World Cups about coming back to coach the men's national team through the World Cup. And they want to have Lozano be on his staff and an assistant and then take back over after the World Cup. Now, El Vasco, as he's known, Aguirre, uh, he just finished uh, his tenure with Mallorca in Spain back in May. Uh, after falling in penalties in the Copa del Rey final, he is on the market and Mexico, the, the, the federation that is the worst about handling coaches is about to like set a new standard um, for this summer in CONCACAF. Uh, what do you guys make of this for Mexico? Is this an overreaction? Forget the overreaction. They literally are doing like a, like a, like a spouse swap, like, Basically, Mexico, Mexico and, and Jaime Lozano were married, right? And they're saying, baby, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go in this fling for a couple of years with, with my side over here. And then once with I'm my tired ex-wife. of them, <laughs> yeah, with my ex-wife, right? And when I'm tired of them, then, then baby, we're going to get back together and, we, and it's going to be perfect. And we're going we're gonna to last forever. This is wild. Like, when I saw the report about this, this is like, if I'm Lozano, I'm like, Yo, here's what you can do with that assistant role. Here's what you can do with that 2030 World uh, World Cup qualifying cycle. Peace, and and bonk out because yo, you're trying to replace me, and then uh, I'm supposed to like wait, sit in the wings, and watch y'all do this together. It's basically in the room. Like he's like, yo, I'm in the room, watch y'all do this for two years, and then like once you're tired, he gonna leave, and I can I can get back in bed. Which no, like that's this is a terrible situation for Mexico. And on top of that, it's after, like, right after they got eliminated, they went out and forced me, like, no, Lozano's our guy. He's taking us to the World Cup. This is our guy. And then, like, not, like, three days later, they're like, eh, but this other person <laughs> that we used to have, he's cool, too. We can get him, too. Yeah. I don't know we're what to do right We're there. just going to bring yeah. him in for, you know, a couple of years. Let him do the thing that you're looking forward to doing. And then you can you can... You can drive again. You could try it again in 2020 after the after the World Cup. In 20, you can you can start the cycle for the 2030 World Cup. Yeah. Do you think he actually thinks he would get through that cycle? Much less no one this has. cycle. Yeah, no, they no had one. like six coaches this cycle. What are you talking? This I, should be number seven. Like, what are we talking yeah. about? <laughs> Donald, the the last thing that you said was like what I thought was the funniest was because like yeah we were like all the briefings coming out of this was like. You know, Canada's, I'm not Canada, 
uh, Mexico, like, you know, they're really starting to get it together over here. Like, you know, they're going to be, they're not going to make that, you know, knee jerk reaction. They're, you know, they're setting themselves up for, for long term success and getting the youth teams back on track and like all of this stuff. And I think it was the next day that it was like, oh, uh, Aguirre may be coming in. We, I mean, we were, we were at the pregame for the U.S. Uruguay game talking about the fact that, you know, that Mexico had been eliminated and they like, they came out with the report. They had the whole, you know, they had the Federation president standing there like triumphant, like defiant, like, nah, this is our guy. And we're like, man, the, the team that is known for overreactions has decided to react sensibly. This is amazing. What is going on here? No, it was, it was short lived. Like they, they, they just needed time to figure out who they were going to overreact with. And this, that person apparently is Javier Aguirre. Yeah, I mean, he's got track record of success. Both World Cups, he's coached them in. They've gotten out of the group stage, um, still failing to play that fifth match. Um, but yeah, Lozano, he he gets the job because he wins a Gold Cup. He loses the Nations League finals. And then this tournament, we're talking about, like, he, I don't know if Copa America is worth like quitting on somebody over it's got to be like a pattern of things and the stuff that we saw with burhalter that built up to him getting fired over the results i don't think we've seen that with with lozano and well they did get molly Watt by uruguay right before Copa america and then they lost to brazil so they had a string of losses entering the tournament uh i think going going back I, they had i think they only had one win since like you know March of twenty uh, of yeah. twenty twenty four, Lozano's record it with the national team is ten wins, four draws, seven losses. So it's not great. Berhalter had a better record than that, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's a tough. They still haven't officially announced any of this. This is all you know speculation and reports, but it does look like Lozano is getting kind of forced out with the World Cup around the corner he's getting put in the corner he's getting put in timeout yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> while everyone has ice cream and then once they're done he ice has cream, to watch. now you can rejoin the group yeah all right so those are the big coaching changes going on uh while we wrap up i do want to just ask so there's a lot of talk especially with the host countries that this was like the last um best competition that some of these teams are going to have before the world cup that's being hosted here. And it's a crucial time for the region. What did we learn about CONCACAF this summer with Copa America? Now I do want to preface this with some information. Uh, We talked about the refereeing a bit. I did want to note that compared to the last Copa America, the Centenario, which was organized more by U.S. soccer and CONCACAF, they had more say in. Um, this tournament featured less CONCACAF referees. There were more international referees for this tournament. I also want to point out that if you take the group stage alone, teams performed better in this Copa America than they did in 2016. Uh, that's based on points. That's based on goal differential. Um, same number of teams advanced, but obviously with Canada bowing out in the semifinals, 2016 was the U S bowing out in the semifinals. Did we see any sort of growth with CONCACAF or the perception of CONCACAF this summer? Not the perception. I mean, the perception that I I'm left with is that CONCACAF has a lot of work to do to get ready for the world cup. And it's not just the three that are hosting. It's all the teams, right? Like even even Panama, right? Like Panama, I think did well um, to get out of the group, and and then of course they got dusted by a team that they should have got dusted by. Yeah, but that's the thing, right? Like Ven- if you think about some of the surprises in this tournament, Panama was one, Venezuela was one. Venezuela won their group when they were probably picked to finish dead last in their group. But again, that's a team that you could see in the group stage of a World Cup that you're thinking, oh, Venezuela, that's great. That you know because they expand it, you're getting the the you know the dredge of the uh of of comma bowl and venezuela can come in and just and just bust you up and that's what they did so i you 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 learn that despite the fact that you look at yeah okay bolivia 
hasn't won and they've only won two games in what three years or something like that and again one was in that fifa series um in saudi arabia and the other was at home so they haven't won a real real game in a long time that's one thing but even chile and peru those teams are still solid they may not have gotten out of the group but they're still solid venezuela you know has improved quite a bit paraguay you know still a solid team and then you have ecuador's ones, gotten right ecuador's gotten better Colum- ecuador gets colombia better. is like arguably the best the... team in the world right now like that's how yeah. good they're playing yeah I mean, they haven't lost yeah. in two years yeah Uruguay has gotten much much better like they're mm-hmm. a more complete team right now though they Coaching. though they are better at fist fighting <laughs> playing soccer they right? can they can hum a glass bottle i don't mm-hmm. know if you saw that video no nope. i've <laughs> yeah. seen all of them bentaker can throw a bottle yeah there uh there's been more than enough nonsense to feel at home during this tournament but it does feel like the vibes are not nearly the same like it's not a fun nonsense it is a stupid nonsense mm-hmm. that we're getting in this copa america I mean, because like you, you look at it, you know, of your teams that played only one of your four nations league finals teams made it out of the group. Two of your three hosts, like Don said, two of three of your host countries for the 2026 World Cup didn't advance. And so like it was not a great look for CONCACAF. Um, yeah. Ex- I mean, the problem is that in a tournament, in a tournament setting, there is a lot of random. Like, you can't necessarily... Yes, teams will play each other, and you can see on the field whether they match up well, and there's a lot of luck involved, and things happen during a game. There are red cards, there are injuries, uh, goals happen. But I, the thing that I'm trying to look at positively for CONCACAF is that the team, one of the teams that had to qualify for this tournament that was playing a play-in game in March went to the semifinals. It's like that is a, not a top four CONCACAF team that made it to the semifinals of Copa America with your Colombia's and your Brazil's and Argentina's like you can frame it that way that Panama is even getting through. And you can maybe use that to write off some of the disappointment of the U S because with U.S. losing to, they played a tight game against Uruguay. They lost to Panama, but that's friendly fire. That's almost CONCACAF saying, yeah, our team, or even our best teams in CONCACAF aren't invincible. I think the the argument you just laid out is great for the soccer junkies like us, right? Like, yeah. we're, we're, we're going to remember the stupid of this tournament. But when you look at the Wikipedia page for 2016, most people are going to forget some of the vibes of that tournament, right? But they're just going to look at the Wikipedia and say, hey, the United States won their group, right? Or, you know, Mexico won their group. Here, they're going to look back and they're going to say, United States didn't get out of the group. First, you know, hosts, air quotes, since, you know, since they started doing fixed hosts to get out of the, to fail to get out of the group. Mexico didn't get out of the group. Canada went to the semifinals. There's all these things that they're, that will become narratives down the line when people forget the details of this tournament. And I think that is what you're left with, right? The history books are not going to remember the referee who figure out a way to show a yellow card and then wave play on at the same time, right? You're not going to you're not going to see it. You're not going to talk oh, about no. the ref who apparently found out that time can be converted into Canadian money. Um, so four minutes is really like three minutes and forty six seconds when he blows whistle. Like you yeah. don't you, you can you're not going to you're not going to hear about that two years from now, right? Just like you know, some people don't even remember what happened. All the details of the last world cup and that was less than two years ago right so you have those things that that kaka calf needs to build upon and say hey look this was not a good tournament for us yes we had a couple of bright spots but some of the teams obviously you want to look back and say yo kaka calf had six teams in this tournament and four out of six got out of the group or something like that only two advancing is not a good look because when you look back they're just going to say hey two out of six one of them was canada they scored one goal like that that's not a a great showing for the region but it's not the end of the world for the region either yeah i also do think we need to stress that this was con mobile's party you know they are the ones that kind of get to run the show here 
and trying to validate yourself on their terms. I don't know if it's best for CONCACAF. I think there's a lot of opportunity with next year's Gold Cup to try to get some guest teams in there, kind of look at the format and see if you can learn something from how these Copa Americas have gone. If you can bring in some competition to kind of, you know, test yourself and get more of these teams in CONCACAF involved because it is kind of shitty that CONMOBILE gets 10 teams and CONCACAF gets six, you know, CONCACAF's got to do a better job of, um, you know, just putting on a show for themselves, per se. Yeah. Any final thoughts on Copa America? Something that we hope will never happen again? No. Well, I well, no, I, <laughs> I, I, I do hope it happens again. I just hope it happens. Uh, you know, I hope the United States gets to participate in this in 2028. I just hope it's in South America. Yes, that was exactly what I was going to say. I had my finger up like, Donald, I, mm-hmm. I need to add to that. You knew I was like, going to say it. Yes, yes. I want to do that Copa, Copa America elsewhere. Right. Yeah, um, we shouldn't be taking, like, I, I've i seen a lot of very frustrating takes. Me, like, oh, we should just make this a US tournament in the U.S. Like, this isn't our deal. This Like, we shouldn't be taken from the South America. Like, this is an important tournament. And all of these people, the, the other frustrating thing is, like, all of these people, um, the the QSMNT crowd um, that likes to talk about the fact of like we don't play anywhere hard we don't play teams away um, it's because we keep being so receptive to these tournaments taking place in the U S and we should be more willing I, it, it's all about it's all about the money it's all about the money but you know yeah. I I think they should be pushing more like we'll help we even help you organize it but like let's do it somewhere else but also yeah. if you think about it right like. I don't know where they, they have a rotation in the United States. I believe we or I'm sorry, in South America for Copa America. I believe we took Peru's spot air air quotes um, because Peru didn't want to. Host Ecuador. It was Ecuador. Ecu- well, no, it was Ecuador. And then Peru said, we'll take it. And then Peru was like, ah, we're not going to be ready for it. Um, and so it became that's when the US, U.S. apparently came in and said, hey, got an idea for you. Yeah. But come make some money. 2028. Obviously, I don't know who's supposed to have it next. But here's the thing. If it's in paraguay argentina or uruguay they are hosting the opening three matches of the 2030 world cup it would behoove us to want to go down there and scout out what it would be like to play down there in one of those countries Uh, or i mean in south america in general but especially if it's one of those three countries what it would be like to go down there what it'll be like to be in you know a crowd atmosphere like that because i promise you they are going to engineer some way as the nation that travels the most for every single world cup they're going to engineer a way to put us in one of those three countries for this 2030 World Cup that has taken place on three continents. Uh, I do want to point out that the Wikipedia for the 2028 Copa America does refer to a report from a Brazilian newspaper, O Global, that says there's a prior contract between Conmobile and the USSF for the U.S. to host the tournament in 2028 as well. I don't know if that's actually going to happen, but... <sighs> I try. I'm not. I'm not paying fucking two hundred dollars for group stage tickets again. Do you, you know how not. much? Do you know how much is going to be in two, two, 2028? It's going to be five hundred dollars. So dumb. Like that is one of the frustrating things is that these stadiums were not full for these games because they could have been, and all it took was Conor Bell being smarter about how they price tickets because a lot of people got priced out. And a lot of people who really would have enjoyed being at these games didn't get the opportunity. And it's just greed that I think gr- the greed of this tournament is really what turned me off about the whole thing. That would be wild for us to host Copa America in 2028, right before we host the Olympics that same summer. Yeah. I, but I mean, that the Olympics is in LA, so it's not like. But soccer has played all across the country, so um that's that's the they're playing the Olympic games. They're playing Olympic games. They're playing all the games in, in, in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, yeah, yeah, and Hawaii. So, I mean, at least Hawaii is the West Coast, correct? I'm I'm sure Hard Rock Stadium will be available for Copa America. They can play as many games as they want there, and they will sell sell all the tickets. Mm-hmm. If you if you got Texas and Florida, they'll they'll make enough money. Um. All right, I think we'll wrap it up. I think it's time for one more round. I need a refill. I have, we haven't got to the what are you drinking part yet of the one more round, but uh, just shout out Boulevard in Kansas City. I'm drinking the Quirk Hard Seltzer Rocket Pop. Uh, that, that was we good. Were slugging down 
in Kansas City. It was a good time. Um, Donald, where can people find you and your podcast with your famous guests? Yes, so uh, USA Soccer Cast is my other soccer pod. Uh, you can which, which covers the U.S. national teams, and also I write for Stars and Stripes FC, doing a lot around Copa America and the Olympics. You can find me on Twitter at Blazing DW. All of that's going to be posted somewhere on there. Yep. You can find me at J Slape SSP. Maybe someday I'll write something for Broadway again, but uh, <laughs> don't don't. Uh, I'm in semi semi retirement these days. Yeah, right. Something about BJ Callahan taking over Nashville SC. Exciting Maybe. times. Listen, th- there are only so many CONCACAF Nations League winning coaches out there. So it's exciting two. times for us here. Only two. Yeah. One of them's got a job. The other one doesn't. Um, and yeah, follow us at PodCACAF, P O D CACAF, on all your social medias. And like we talked about at the top, support us on Patreon patreon.com backslash podcast uh really appreciate everyone for their support obviously we know there's been a lack of content recently but nation's league is right around the corner so, you know we got to stick to our bread and butter this fall gonna be huge we're we're very excited about it uh we're excited about uh you listening and we appreciate you and we're gonna wrap it up right here thanks for listening Thank <laughs> you.